while we're continuing our series of Heroes of Legendary, Legendary Faith. How many of you have found yourself in a company of grumblers at times? Don't look around, all right? Straight at me, look, look around. <laughs> we find ourselves in company of people who complain, you know, monku, monku, monku about every little thing now and then. Well, the Bible teaches us how to handle ourselves in situations like that. And Pastor Wayne has a great message for all of us. But before he comes out and teaches us about that, take a look at this. How was your weekend, girl? John, all I did was work. Yeah, I know what you mean. Thank goodness Ken is out of here. He was such a slave driver. Not as if he pays me that much. Yeah, I know. My husband thinks I'm overworked and underpaid. You wait until you work here as long as I have. You see how much time you have for your family. Well, thank goodness he's out of here. Did you hear anything about that new boss? Sandra mentioned something about that new boss coming aboard was worse than Ken. Worse? Yeah, she runs a tight ship. Drill sergeant, if you think that is bad now, you wait. Well. I'll quit. You know, I got a job offer at JBC. Hey, good for you. Yeah, I'll wait to the right moment, then I'm gonna quit. You're you know such a I mean? drama queen. <laughs> Shut up. Well, I guess we better get to that staffing for the big announcement. Yeah. And listen to Michelle give her, I have too much caffeine and we're so great on the job. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry. And good morning, Fred. Sorry. Good morning, girl. Any good news today? Michelle? I just want to say that our team has done such an awesome job. We managed to get even closer to our advertising sales goal. It's so exciting. We got verbal commitments from three clients this past weekend. The recruiting team worked so hard every day. Can, can we just give them a hand? Great, great job. Yeah. That's great. Anyone else? No? Well, today is a big day. As you know, Ken, our previous advertising manager, has moved on to the mainland. Onward and upward for him, but it leaves a big hole for us. I'm proud to announce today that we're going to fill that gap with our own Deanna Johnson. Have a hand for Deanna, please. Deanna, would you like to say a few words to the team? Yes, I just want to thank you guys for a big, warm welcome. I know some of you have an idea of what I'm like, but don't worry, I won't disappoint you. Thank you. I know things are going to be great. Now we move on to the next order of business. What are we going to do? Yeah, Without thinking twice, got 2020 vision when we're watching someone else, but it's a little blurry when we're looking at ourselves. I can't forget to check the mirror, that's where I'll find the only one that he wants me to change. Begin with me, turn my world upside down, come change my heart around, Lord, keep on washing me. Begin with 
say thank you to Myla Gibson for our beautiful song. Let's take out our notes as we continue in our series called Heroes of Legendary Faith, who out of the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, where God picks the elite of the elite, so they speak to us through the annals of time, and they speak to us from yesteryear about problems and things we're facing in this year. And today we're going to hear from Moses, who was smack dab in the middle of two million grumblers in the desert as he took them out of Egypt towards the promised land. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, he was around quite a few grumbling people. How many of you, now I've got to be honest, how many of you, this is church, how many of you have a tendency to grumble? Raise your hand, come on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, there's a real scientific test to see how much you grumble. So here it is, would you just fold your hands like this? Just fold them together, yeah, just interlock your fingers, yeah, okay. Now, try interlocking them the other way. Just kind of change the fingers. Kind of feels funny, doesn't it? Okay, go back to what's most comfortable. Yeah. Now, if you take a look at down, there's a scientific way to see how much you grumble. And if your right thumb is overlapping your left thumb, you grumble like half the time. <laughs> now, take a look at your wife. Just see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty true, isn't it? Pretty true. Now, if your left thumb is overlapping your right, you grumble the other half of the time. <laughs> uh, we all have a tendency to grumble. I mean, we're all prone to that. You know, it just kind of gives you this false sense of superiority, you know, power, because like by grumbling, in the lunchroom, I can take on the government. I can take on the boss. I can take on the leadership. I can take on the governor, take on the mayor, grumbling about them. Man, I can grumble about them and let everybody know I'm smarter than them until I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> you know, you, that's how it is with grumbling. You can let everybody know how smart you are in the lunchroom. And so that's one of the ways we deal with problems. But we all have this tendency to grumble, even if there's no reason. It's sort of like the Portuguese guy in the restaurant. He calls the waiter, he says, waiter, come over here, it's hot, it's hot in this restaurant, change that temperature. So he smiles and the guy walks in the back room. 15 minutes later, waiter, waiter, I thought I told you it was change the temperature, but now it's too cold, too cold, change our temperature again. So he smiles and goes to the back room. 15 minutes later, hey, it's too hot. It's too hot. Change the temperature. Well, he does this about four or five times. Finally, another customer calls the waiter and says, Waiter, come over here. Says, that guy's been grumbling for the last hour and 15 minutes. Throw the bum out. All he does is grumble. And the waiter says, Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind. He says, What do you mean you don't mind? And his little twinkle came to his eye, and the waiter said, We don't even have air conditioning here. <laughs> Some of us are just prone to grumble. But why do we tend to grumble? Well, you know, if you just get real down and dirty about it, it's because we have problems in our society, in our families. And it's one of the ways that we deal with grumbling. See, actually, you can either resolve the problem, which will require some counseling or talking to the person or resolving it or asking God for wisdom and insight, or we can just grumble about it. And the easier way to deal with, not necessarily resolve, but deal with problems is, the easier way is what? Grumble. Is grumble. And so we like to grumble because we have this sense of, I'm doing something for this society because I'm telling you how bad the governor is right now. And we just grumble. Well, it kind of gives us this sense of, we're dealing with the problem. But you know, there's problems everywhere. Isn't that right? There's not going to be any perfect scenarios. No perfect... <laughs> Uh, marriage, no perfect government, no perfect wife, no perfect husband. Anna married the last one. There just aren't any. There's no perfect ministries. There's no perfect jobs. There's not even any perfect churches. We all have accidents. We all have what I, what I call natural disasters. I know, Anna gave birth to three. Uh, they're, just, they're just there. 
and problems will arise in a greater way because of the vocation that you choose. If you choose like to be a hermit, that's one thing. If you choose to work with people, the potentiality of problems will increase exponentially. Isn't that right? If you choose one way of life or another, you choose to get married, you're going to have choke problems. You choose to have kids, you're going to have disastrous problems. You're going to have all kinds. But it's the way you choose your pathway in life. And Moses was one who could have lived in, the posh, in a posh kind of situation as Pharaoh's son. But he chose, because he saw the plight of his people, the Hebrews, he chose to go and help them. And because of that, he encounters two million grumblers. Now, if you're not careful, you'll let the grumbling environment actually intoxicate and affect you, as did him. He was so upset one day of grumblers, he knee-jerk reaction, got angry and spouted off, and it disqualified him from entering the promised land. So he's going to teach us some things about grumblings from the past. He knows. If there's anybody that knows about how to grumble and not to grumble, it's Moses. But let's read how he chose a vocation that increased the potential of problems. Let's read. Go. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now it says, by faith, Moses made a choice. One of the things I want us to see in this series is faith is not some ethereal thing that you can't grasp. It's not some theological mystery. Faith is a very practical thing that is seen in the choices we make in everyday life. And it says he chose to rather endure ill treatment with whom? His enemies? No, with the people of God. Do you know that when you work with even the people of God, there's going to be an increase of problems which we can choose to either grumble or resolve. And so Moses chose that, and it increased the amount of problems. That's a choice we make. If you choose to get married, you're going to have problems. Kids, problems. Job, problems. You're going to find yourself working with people that are still growing. You're going to find yourself working with people who make mistakes and do dumb things. Even churches are going to have problems. No. That's right. I mean, not this church, but you know, other churches have <laughs> a lot of problems. <laughs> hey, you know, I usually hear this third hand. But, you know, when people say, oh, that church has problems, I know they don't understand anything about church and they're trying to be holier than they really are. Because you know, I get this third hand. Someone will say this to someone else and then it'll come to me. And, and the other day someone said, hey, someone said they don't want to come to New Hope because there's a lot of problems in that church. That's what they said. I said, what do you mean? You know, because at first you want to be defensive. But then you think, oh, wait a minute, what do you mean? And it's, well, you know, there's people there that are having marriage problems. Someone else is on drugs. Someone else is about to be arraigned to go into prison. They're all in New Hope. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said to this guy, wait a minute. I mean, can, can you think of a better place for someone to be that's having marriage problems in church? Where else would you want them to be? In the bar? That's why so many go to the bar, because that's where they're accepted. Churches don't even accept people like people in the bars do. And if church is going to reject people, man, that's why it's filling up all of the taverns. I think we should be a place that's not uh, a fashion show. The church is not a Sunday fashion show for Christians. It's a hospital. I mean, it's not, we think it's a fashion show. You know, we got to come in, dress up, and, and you walk in church like, you know, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> come on, honey, come on, come on. Oh, hello, hallelujah. No. Kids, come on, come. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Yeah. Sit down, sit down nice. Okay, everybody nice. Okay, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But this is not a fashion show for Jesus. No, it's a hospital. It's a hospital for people that are struggling with drugs or marriage or uh, stuff on the inside or emotions. I can't think of a better place for you to be. Now watch this. The devil, when you're having marriage problems or personal problems, I'll tell you what the devil's going to say to you. I know what he's saying to you. Don't go to church. You got problems. Don't go to church. You shouldn't go to church because you got this problem. I, there's no better place for you to be than right here. This is a hospital, not a fashion show. Wouldn't it be dumb if someone said, hey, wait, wait, you know Queen's Hospital? 
people sick over there, sick. <laughs> yeah, well, what, do you, what do you think? And so we have made a commitment that we will not be ashamed of any, in any way of the people that God brings to this place because I can't think of a better place for them to be. I mean, just think of us. How many of us were either sick or had marriage problems or on drugs or uh, those kinds of things? Isn't that right? Yeah. You think of those people, drugs, marriage problems, infidelity, lack of integrity. Uh, that's when Elwin came. And then look at him. <laughs> But problems, we can choose how we're going to deal with those. But let me tell you the greatest test of our faith. The greatest test of our faith is, would you write a number one? The greatest test of our faith is stewarding the problems that God assigns to us. Stewarding the what? The problems. You see, inevitably, as Matthew 18 says, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. They will come. But you see, we all line up in this line over here because God is handing out blessings. So we all steward God's blessing. God, if you give me blessings, oh God, if you give me like plenty of money, I'll give you some. <laughs> God, if you give me that real big house in Kahala, oh Lord, I'll, use, I'll steward it well for like Bible studies once a year. But Lord, I'll, be, I'll just give, give you all, anything, you know, I'll steward it well. But the Lord is saying, oh, I've got some blessings to pass out, but you know, I've got a lot of problems that... Uh, that are hard on my heart. They're heavy on my heart. And, and I need people to help just share this. Oh, no, no, I want the blessings. No, no, you see, I've got a guy here that he's kind of arrogant, a little proud, but inside he's really good. I mean, he, he, he sticks his foot in his mouth. At, what's his name? Uh, oh, si Simon Peter. But on the outside, he's not real good, but on the inside, he can change the world. I got another guy, he's got a bad track record. He's kind of accused of alleged murdering people, and, and, uh, but he's really good. What's his name? A Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Over here, you got a guy that's really kind of a coward, you know, but I tell you, he can do good things if you just kind of work with him. Gideon's his name. Yeah, and then another one, yeah, he had some infidelity, but, but a really good man, he really is. Oh, his name is David, son of Jesse. Now, now, these guys don't look good on the outside. Now, I got some problems with them, but I tell you, will someone just steward the problems? No, 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 not talk about them, not conclude how bad they are. No, because they're not there yet. I just need people to step into their life, counsel, help, and, and kind of encourage. Could, could you just accept them for a while, even though they don't look good? Don't be ashamed of them. Just kind of help them, because they'll turn out real good. Uh, no church? Nobody? Oh, blessings. Oh, yeah, a lot of you lining up for that. But any, anybody here? You see, the Lord says that the greatest test of our faith is not how we steward blessings, but maybe more so how we steward the problems. Let's read what it says here in 1 Peter 4. Go. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful tests you're suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. Rather, be glad that you are sharing in Christ's yeah, these are going to be tough things, but you're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And so we say, Lord, we'll steward those in our church. We'll work with them through that. Yeah, we'll, we'll work with it. And then you see God's best start to come out. But we're going to have problems. We can choose to grumble or we can choose to resolve. But we always want God's blessings, don't we? And even as pastors, sometimes I don't want to have to do all of the stuff to work people through. I just want the good veterans to come to the church. I, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to share this story, but there was a guy in Hilo that he was one of the more prominent Pakalolo farmers in Pune. And uh, he had a huge harvest coming up. And, well, he, this guy comes to me after church one day, and he tells me the story. He said... Pastor, I'm in trouble. I said, what? He said, uh, this is my first time here, and I, I, I got the biggest crop I ever had. The green harvest never took, took them, and, and I got big the kind of stems, and, and brother, I made them all good and packaged, and I got a buyer waiting, $100,000 crop waiting, and the guy has the money and everything, and I got saved this morning. <laughs> I thought, you got a problem, brother. You got a problem. <laughs> And I thought, oh, no, how am I going to work through this? So he said, it's $100 wait, $100,000 waiting. What do you think I'm supposed to do? And I'm just so embarrassed. But my first thought was, I've got to teach you how to tithe. <laughs> but, oh, no, 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 no. You know, oh, no, no. 
Because we always want the blessings but not have to do this part here. And that's just how we are. It's just like inbred in our nature. And God is saying the greatest test of your faith is how you steward the problems, not the blessings. It has a great ending. I mean, he destroyed all of that stuff. Can you believe that? And today he is growing vegetables. <laughs> and still a part of the church. A different kind of greens. But stewarding the blessings versus stewarding the problems. That's the greatest test. Oh, boy, I tell you, God's going to give us problems and will we be able to do that? You say, well, Wayne, wh why do we even have, like, problems? Why do problems even surface? Because I thought you could pray and believe God and all the problems will disappear. <laughs> no, they actually surface. What? Yeah, you see, when you come to Christ... All the stuff that's inside of you and me, whether it be a temptation or a tendency to in, uh, lack of integrity or infidelity or grumbling, anger, uh, getting vengeance, revenge, all of that stuff could be in seed form. And something happens in the family or the, with the wife or the son or the daughter or this at work or that at work, and the stuff that's in resident goes, and it comes to the surface. And so now I want to get revenge. I want to tell this guy off. I want to do this. I want to be sneaky and do this. And all of that stuff was in seed form, but a problem takes place and boop, 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 that stuff comes up. And you know what God is saying? You know the reason you're having problems is because this is what we're going to work on. This is where you're at. And if you can blame the problem, you can grumble about the problem, but the problem's not the problem. I just use that problem to surface stuff that's inside of you right now. And I'm going to bring that to the service to say, this is where you're at, and we're going to work on this. Now, we can blame other people and grumble about it, but you know what? You'll never deal with these things. Get rid of the problems. The problems go, and then these things will back down into seed form, but they're still resident in you. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, it's going to pop out in a more vicious form. So the Lord allows these things to surface because he's going to work on these. And it's sort of like the Lord saying, that's where you're at. It's like you're in a big mall and you're trying to find your way, navigate all of these stores and hallways, and you go to a kiosk for directions and it has a big arrow and it says, you are here. Yeah. And the Lord is saying, this is where you are. Now, you can do an end run on it. You can maneuver. You can manipulate. You can shuck. You can jive. You can do whatever you want to. Or you can work through it and ask me for wisdom and insight. You know what we'll do? We'll work on that together. And it won't just be in recess again. It will be removed. And you'll be stronger to deal with the problems that come up. You see, it's sort of like lifting weights in the gym. Because you say, can't you just pray and problems go away? No, 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 no. Do the problems get lighter? Mm, they sort of get lighter as you grow in the Lord, but they don't get lighter. You just get stronger, so they're not as heavy anymore. You're in the gym, you're lifting 100 pounds, and at first, oh, it's hard. Oh, it's hard to lift 100 pounds. Now, you can grumble about the... You can blame the gym. You can say, man, it's so hard, man. Man, you can grumble. Oh, man, it says 100 pounds, but it's really 1,000. Oh, man, those guys, they fake me out. Oh, it's so hard. You can grumble and grumble and grumble, or you can work through it. And after a while of doing this, that 100 pounds isn't 100 pounds anymore. It's not that it physically becomes 50 or 40. It's just that it feels like 40, 20. It's just it's easier after a while. You can do it with one arm because what? The weight didn't get any lighter. It's just now that you're, you're much more apt to handle those, and they're not as big of a burden anymore. So what happens is your faith gets deeper because you've been pressing through and your muscles get stronger. Then after a while, I don't just lift 100. I can lift 200. And then I can lift 300. I can lift 400. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. But I tell you, so does your, all your problems go away? No. They just get lighter and they don't bother you as much. Why? Because your faith gets stronger. Now, in order to build faith, to become a hero of legendary faith, you don't do an end run or grumble about. You work through and ask God for wisdom. Let me tell you, when you hit problems, let me tell you one thing that is not an option. Would you write down, grumbling is not an option. Don't take that route. Just don't take it. You, I mean, you can. You can grumble. You can do whatever you want. But the more you grumble, it will not change anything. 
In fact, I need to tell you something about grumbling. You say, Wayne, Wayne, why does the Bible speak about not grumbling? Because it's a bad thing? Well, yes, yes and no. There is a spiritual principle you must catch today. Don't miss this, all right? You've got to catch this spiritual principle. It is a universal principle, a divine principle about grumbling. And it's found in the book of Proverbs. Let's read it here together in the Proverbs 11, 27. Go. If you search for good, you will find favor. But if you search for evil, it will... Yeah, if you search for evil, it'll find you. Underline that. It'll find you. Proverbs are usually written in couplets or in stereo. It'll have a positive and then contrasted with a negative or a negative and contrasted with a positive. And so it says here, if you are looking for good, you will find the favor of God. God is saying, that's what you need to do. But if you search for evil or see what's wrong, see the problems and grumble about problems, if you're searching for evil, evil will what? It'll find you. You see, when I'm grumbling about stuff and I'm just looking at what's wrong so I can grumble and have a false sense of superiority over whomever. When I am grumbling, it's like blood to a shark, so is grumbling to the devil. Because the Bible says, when I'm looking for evil, evil will find me. It's like the, the devil smells that blood and comes. And when I'm grumbling about stuff, it's like I'm inviting him in. I'm giving him entree. Evil will find you. What it's saying is here, the best thing you can do for your marriage is, first of all, don't grumble about it. Oh, resolve things, learn to appeal to those, pray. It just lots of other options to start with, but not grumbling. Because if you grumble about your marriage, you grumble about your family, you watch, nothing good will come out of that. Nothing good. And if you grumble, here's what the Bible says, you are opening the door for demonic intrusion. And you're inviting a demonic presence in. Evil will find you. So not only do I grumble about what's happening in my family, I now add to that a demonic presence. And I tell you, It'll go down fast after that. You ask people that start grumbling about their marriages, just watch how fast it starts to slide after that. There's a lot of other options. Grumbling is not one. Let's read what 1 Corinthians 10 says, and this is alluding to the people of the desert who were grumbling under Moses' leadership. And let's read what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 10. Go. Don't grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the... Yeah, underline destroyed by the destroyer. Don't grumble as some did. Why? Because they invited demonic intrusion. And the thief, John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yeah, when I invite him in, he's got one goal in mind, and that's to destroy your future. Well, how, how does he get an open door, get a foothold? Well, because I lay the tarmac for him through grumbling, which diminishes my faith diminishes my hope for any of the miraculous, di diminishes my anticipation of God moving because I've made conclusions about whatever it might be. And when you have zero hope, then basically you say, all right, devil, it's all yours. And he comes in. Well, instead of grumbling, the Bible says instead, would you write it in your next bullet, use wisdom. Use, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. It's almost the opposite of grumbling. If you grumble, if you get angry, if you blame, defend, rationalize, you can get through life. Things happen at work, at church, whatever. You can grumble. You can grumble. And you can get through life. You'll have a rough, rough haul of it, but you can get through life. But let me tell you, you may be known to be a grumbler, angry person, Got to watch out for his temper. He always bails out on you. He's a little strange. He's a little ambivalent or changeable. You'll be known for a lot of things. But let me tell you one thing. If you grumble, you will never be known for. You'll never be known for your wisdom. You'll never be known at the end that that man was a wise man or a woman, a wise woman. Because you've got to choose either. You can grumble or you can ask God for wisdom to resolve something. Choose wisdom. And here's a way that the Bible says that you can view problems that will help you to build wisdom. And again, it's from Proverbs. Let's read this scripture in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 23. Go. Doing wickedness is like sport to a fool, and so is wisdom to a man 
of understanding. Yeah, doing wickedness, it's like fools see doing wickedness like a sport. They excel at it. That's negative. Positive, but you know what? People of understanding, they see wisdom like a sport, and they excel at it. Well, what is it saying? It's simply saying fools make wickedness a sport. Understanding people make wisdom a sport. So it's sort of like this. Here's your sport or your challenge or your test, athletic test, as it were. You've got a problem that you're facing. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever it is. Now, here's the ground rules. You need to resolve this problem, sister, brother. Here's being assigned by God. Resolve this problem in the wisest way possible. That if all the angels of heaven looked at this problem and see how you're resolving it, they'll all say, hands down, that is the wisest way to solve that problem. Because you can solve it in all kinds of ways. But what he's doing is the wisest. Try that. Now, here's the ground rules, Wayne. You can get advice from anybody you want to. You can read anything you want. You can get counsel from anybody you want to to get the amount of wisdom necessary to resolve that. But heaven is watching, and we will judge. We'll be the umpire. Solve this problem the wisest way you can. So think about it. Just think about it. Okay, ready? Go, click, and the timer starts. You see, that's what Proverbs is saying. Look at pro problems and say, what's the wisest way that I could ever, ever resolve this? Hmm. And then you start thinking, oh, this would be better. This would be a better way to do it. This would be a better way to do it. And then you challenge yourself to rise to that. And God is saying, now you're developing wisdom. You see, because there's one character quality, like a diamond. There's one character quality that will only be developed under pressure. That's wisdom. Because you see, when there's pressure on you, you cry out for wisdom. Oh, God, help me to have wisdom. And the Bible says this in the book of James. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and will never hold it back from you. So if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask where? Of God. What's the best place to get your wisdom from? Would you write in your next bullet? Daily devotions. In your daily devotions. As you're reading through, you're going to see how Gideon solved this. Paul solved this, the wisdom that David used, the wisdom that Solomon used. And pretty soon as your daily devotions have been going, you're saying, ah, now I'm starting to catch this. So when you hit a problem, you're not out of shape. You've been training, you've been increasing, developing wisdom from the ages. And so you enter this problem with a whole lot more training and fortitude and competence than you would have otherwise. And so that 100-pound weight, which would be heavy to somebody who hasn't trained, you'll still have to lift it, but it's not that heavy. Where do you get that? Daily devotions. If you haven't started, please do. You can get a bookmark outside and just start. If you can only do half, do half. But start in the discipline of it, and it'll increase your wisdom commensurately. Your daily devotions. So if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of... God, who gives to all men generously. Now, let me tell you where that verse follows. Let me give you the verse above it. Because you see, there's only one character quality that's built like a diamond under pressure, and that's wisdom. When it says, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously, if any man lacks wisdom, let me now quote to you the verse in front of it. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you'll be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. You see, what he's saying is wisdom is going to be necessary to resolve these things. Now, you can either grumble or you can ask God for wisdom and insight and you'll grow. And you'll be someone where the Lord says, that's how to do it. You say, you know, Wayne, I'd love to do that. And I I'd sure... Sure will. But, you know, there's sometimes there's people you've got to work with. I mean, I can kind of do that. That's on the inside. But what if you've got to deal with people? What do you do? You just kind of deny? Sometimes I've got to talk to these people. I know not grumble about them, but what if they're doing stuff that I just need to talk to them about? Mm -hmm. Good. Then number two, after you have number one down, 
And you know the reason you don't grumble. You're asking God for wisdom. Number two, then if you have to, learn to appeal before coming to conclusions. Learn to appeal to people. Appeal. No, not rebuke, not punch, not sabotage, not slander, not yell, but appeal. That means reason with. Well, it's so easy to make conclusions rather than to appeal to someone. And we need to learn to appeal to people rather than saying, you know what God says? God said you're going to hell, hell, hell. No, you don't just make conclusions. You appeal to that person. Hey, here's some things that are happening. Can I give you an option? You know, and I know I may have misunderstood something, but here's an option that maybe will help the team camaraderie, spread the the cores. Let's just kind of work this out and let's see if we can do something about it. And so you learn to appeal. And that's wisdom. Let's read what James says as you approach people. This should be some of the qualities by which you approach them. James 3, go. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. Here it is, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. The wisdom from above is first pure. In other words, when I appeal to somebody, I've got to make sure that my heart is pure. That I'm not coming to this guy with ulterior motives. Now, one of the most important things to make sure your heart is pure is here it is. Make sure that before I appeal to somebody that I've got to work something out with, make sure that forgiveness has already taken place before I talk with them. Never, 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 never. Let your forgiveness for this person be determined by how they respond to you. Which means, I'll talk to this guy, but if, what if he just throws it back in my face? Then that's it. No, because then if that person doesn't accept what you have to say, the infection goes deeper. But if you've already forgiven because you went to the cross first before you went to the person... And the forgiveness is given. The guy can tell you, hey, hang it on your nose. You'll say, it's all right. I just thought this might help. But forgiveness is already given, so it doesn't really matter. I'm just, I'm going to give you this with a pure heart. My role is not to change his heart. My role is to present what I present with a pure heart. And it is God's role to change his heart. Don't switch the roles. All my role is to present it as Jesus would because forgiveness is already given. And this, I think, just will help relationships and will help this guy become a better person. If he rejects it, that's okay. It's all right. I just appeal to you and present it to you and your heart is pure and you leave it. But if it's a godly advice, if it's godly appeal and it's done with a pure heart, you know what the Bible says? If it's biblical, what you just said or did, the Bible says, my word will not go forth from me void, but it will accomplish what it was sent forth to accomplish. Because God's word is not dead, it is living, Hebrews 4 says. So as I share this, he can say whatever he wants. To. I just, there it is, and it's already in. You heard it. And I walk away, and it's doing its work. I just make sure that my role is presented with a pure heart. And now it'll do its work. Because that person may reject you. And may not change. But three months later, six months later, that thing starts to grow. And the roots of that break some hard-heartedness. And maybe three years later, things start to make sense. And he starts connecting the dots. Because you gave it with a pure heart. And God's word now starts to take effect. If that person rejects it, it may not be forever. The word is there. Now you say, but what if he does reject me? That's all right. You know what the Bible says? As far as it depends on you... Be at peace with all men. And not as far as it depends on their response. As far as it depends on you. Which means they might slam their door on you, but you keep your door open to them. So that keeps your heart free, see, from vengeance and bitterness. They can slam their door on you. I don't want to see you. That's okay. You keep yours open. There's people with me that don't like me. Moi? Yeah, I don't know why, but they don't like me. But that's okay. I keep my door open to them. And they'll see me in the supermarket and, oh, I hate you. And you can say, oh, but I love you. <laughs> you see, it's just okay. It keeps your heart free because then you can live. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's your responsibility. And if you have to appeal to somebody, appeal to them with a pure heart. 
Make sure it's godly and it's a word of God and leave it with them regardless of the response and the forgiveness is already given. You stand with an open door waiting and it may be three months, three years. But God's word will take effect. I was working with a pastor once and I was talking to him about people coming to church and, and uh, we're talking, like I said today, about those that may have troubles and struggles and you must never be ashamed of whom God brings to the church. Don't you worry. Just accept them and see that, not to endorse their problem, but to help them get better. It's a hospital. It's a place where there's help that's beginning. No, he said, Jesus called disciples. They were God-fearing people. He surrounded himself with disciples not sinners. He spoke to them, but he surrounded himself with disciples. I said, no, he trained disciples to reach those people. That's the people he came to reach. says that he came not for the saved, but for the ones that are lost, not for the well, but the sick. Pretty easy. No, no, he came. And I said, no, no, and we arm wrestled with it. And I said, no, just think about that. Read what the scripture says. Well, about five years later, he invited me to come and speak at his church. So when I went there, I said, you know, uh, I, I want to speak about, you know what we spoke about five years ago? I, I kind of want to talk about opening your hearts to the many that really need to find their way home, but they don't know where to start, and it should be the church. Uh, is that okay? And he said, oh, yeah, you speak that, because we need to hear that. I said, whoa, I thought, remember five years ago, you said, no, disciples only kind. He said, oh, and this is what he said, no. He said, I, I don't think that way anymore. You speak that. That's what we need to hear. I thought, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because when I first shared that with them, it's like, nope. But just leave it. If it's biblical, what, what's the Bible going to do? The Word of God will do its work. Just leave it. Just keep your heart open, and God will now do His work. If it was delivered with a pure heart, and it's biblical, you watch what God can do. But if you're doing it with a wrong heart and it's, your forgiveness is determined by how they respond, well, God can't use that. It's all mixed up with flesh. So our responsibility is to have the wisdom from above, which is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And you lay that in. And when you appeal, then God will use that. You say, but when, what if, though? Because we can't deny that we get upset sometimes at problems and I want to grumble. What do you do with that? Do you just deny it? Do you just drive it down deeper inside? Mm -mm. Did you write down number three? We, f we don't forget that we're Christians. We forget that we're humans. So, would you write down, find a godly lightning rod. Find someone. And preferably sisters with sisters and brothers with brothers but find a lightning rod, which simply is someone that you can talk to and process with and sometimes vomit on because you're upset, and they just ground it for you. They don't, they don't shoulder your offense. They don't say, oh, man, he said what? Let's gang up, punch him together. No, no. <laughs> they, they process it with you, and they ground it. They sift what's good from the bad, and they say, take this. They're a lightning rod. Let's read what the Scripture says. Go. A man of too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. In the Midwest, because they have lightning strikes on buildings, they run up a lightning rod that's taller than the building because if you didn't have one, the lightning strikes the building and the force of electricity runs through the wires into the office equipment and fries all your office equipment. So they run a lightning rod up and when lightning strikes, it hits that rod, copper wire that is grounded, and it goes into the ground. Saves, spares the building. We need people in our lives that are like lightning rods that I can say, you know what, this makes me so mad, la, 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 and that person knows, and you've asked him to be a lightning rod to you, Will you need to let that person speak into your life. He'll sift the bad from the good and say, Wayne, this is what you need to do. Because you're too clouded with subjectivity. You need someone who will be objective. And you've got to keep your heart open to someone who will speak into your life when you need them to. We have three elders in our church. We have um, Dan Shima and George Iranon, Paul Lamb that are elders here. And... Uh, uh, I, I kind of go to them and, can, and I can just barf stuff out to them and they'll listen, sift it out and help me. 
If I'm mad, want to quit, or this or that, they say, no, no, let's listen. No, no, let's take a look at it. And they are like lightning rods, so I don't fry things. Because isn't that true? Sometimes you get mad, you know, your boss says something to you at work, and you just kind of walk out of there, and you can see all these electronic synapses come out. <laughs> you know, smoke coming out. And you're driving down the freeway, get out of my way! And you go home and you yell at your wife. Ah! Wife, and wife fries. She turns to the son. Yeah! And he gets mad. He yells at his sister. Ah! And sister, sister kicks the dog. And dog bites the cat. And the cat finds the doll, bites and eats the head off the doll. It's just, it's this domino effect. You just fry everybody. You need a lightning rod to stop that. I tell you what, Dad, if you ever get yelled at by your boss, go home, just find a doll, bite the head off the doll. <laughs> Saves all these people in the middle. <laughs> but you see, when you have a lightning rod, you can speak to that person and kind of sift through that. And it'll help you because you got to work it through before you start grumbling because that's just like a, it's an outlet. And if you had someone that loves Jesus, loves you, your family, and wants God's best and committed to God's best for you, that's the one you can say, will you be like a lightning rod for me? Cause, and I won't call or talk to anybody uh, if I can just talk with you. And if you will do this for me, love God, love me, be committed to my best for my future. But I need somebody that sometimes I can say like poop to and uh, you won't go, oh, oh, I'm telling. You know, he's just, just kind of work me through it. Is that all right? Yeah, it's all right. I'll do that. And then that'll help you immensely. Now, for example, some spouses can do this, but my wife is not a lightning rod for me. I will share with her, but I share with her after the victory is taken care of, after I've resolved it. Because she loves me so much, if I tell her something, she's got this gift of mercy. It's like, oh, she just gets crushed. So I have to kind of be careful. So I, I'll share with her, but it's from the victory side. Something happened, I resolve it. I say, honey, here's what happened. Man, God did a real good thing, and I'll share with her. But it's from the victory side. If it's from the other side, oh, man, I can't do that. I mean, it's sort of like this never happens. But say a board member kind of gives me a real hard time. We got the greatest board here, but say they gave me a bad time, and I go home and I say, honey, you know, that Vern, man, he gave me a hard time. He called me like a ape. She said, what? He called you what? Ape. Ape? Well, he looks like a chimpanzee. <laughs> I know, I know. That's why. It's terrible. Oh, man, I don't like him. I don't either. Oh, man, well, now she's fried. <laughs> you know? Well, the next day, and this happens a lot. The next day, say, Vern calls me. Hey, Wayne, what? Hey, uh, so sorry what I said last night. Huh? Yeah, I was just so wrong. Oh, okay. Will you forgive me? Yeah, I forgive you. Sure, yeah, we friends. Yeah, mm, okay, goodbye. <laughs> Good. All right. Now, say, everything is cool, copacetic, but I forget to tell my wife. So that Sunday, she's in the back of the church, and Vern walks by, my wife. <laughs> yeah? I say, whoa, honey, what's going on? I hate him. He looked like a chimpanzee. <laughs> oh, no, no, you still, no, oh, no, honey, we resolved that. What? Yeah, he called me the very next day and resolved it. And you didn't tell me? Oh, sorry, yeah? <laughs> So my wife is just so precious, I kind of protect her in certain areas, but I will share with her from the victory side. But I have others, again, men with men, sisters with sisters, that help so much, and I share with them, and it is so healthy. Share, you, here's the bottom line. You need to let somebody speak into your life that loves God, loves you, is committed to God's best for your future, and is biblical. You need to have, somebody's got to speak into your life because there's an old saying that says, the eye cannot see the eye. You can see through, but if your eye is clouded, you need someone else to see. It doesn't matter how old you are, the eye still can't see the eye. You've got to let someone look at it and help you. So it doesn't matter how, I don't care if you've been in church for 20 years, you need to let somebody be able to speak into your life and you've got to let that person know they can. 
if they see anything wrong. Because that's the only way you'll grow and move from grumbling into wisdom. You got to let them speak into your life. It might save your life. Like there's this, these three guys are on death row, this Portuguese guy, Japanese guy, and Hawaiian guy. And they were ready to face the firing squad. And there's old Sage in the cell next door, long, long beard and long hair. And, and he said, come, let me tell you what to say before you die. And the Portuguese guy goes, I don't need nobody tell me what to say before I mock it. That's the dumbest thing. I'm going to die anyway. No, 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 come, let me tell you. Well, the Japanese guy says, speak into my life, Sensei. And so he speaks. So he goes, hey. the Hawaiian guy say, oh, brother, tell me, brother, tell me, tell me. So he speaks into his life, oh, mahalo, eh, bro, mahalo. And he goes back. And the Portuguese guy I don't need nobody talking to my life. That's crazy. I'm going to mock it anyway. Well, the next day, the first one to take by the wall is a Japanese guy, and they push him out to the wall, and these guys are right there with the gun. And so the two guys push him by the wall, and they run away, ready. Aim. And the Japanese guy goes, tornado! What, what, tornado? And he runs off all day looking like that. <laughs> where'd he go, where'd he go? I don't know, just bring the next one, bring the next one. So the Hawaiian guys put it over there. They run up, ready, aim, hurricane! Oh, 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 hurricane! And the guy runs off. Wait, where'd he go? Oh, I don't know, we got one more. Bring down the last one. The Portuguese guy comes in. That's it, ready, aim! The Portuguese guy goes, fire, fire! <laughs> You better let somebody speak into your life. <laughs> We're getting crazy in this place, I tell you. Get a lightning rod because there's going to be problems. They're inevitable. And you'll choose the way of grumbling, which is a spiritual principle. It'll give entree to demonic intrusion, or you can gain wisdom and insight. And there you'll begin to see God's miracles and a strength of faith begin to develop. So the problems don't physically get lighter. They just, you just become stronger until the Lord sees that the people in this church are indeed heroes of legendary faith. Why? Because you understand that faith is pretty applicable. It's every day, and God will help us to gain the wisdom and the faith we need. Are you glad for that? I am. Let's stand together. Thanks, Bertie. Let's bow our heads as we conclude in prayer. You know, I was thinking, there's some of you that are here that uh, are facing some things, and you just need God's wisdom. It might be some things emotionally, in your family, job, whatever. And you say, you know, Lord, I don't know how to untangle this stuff inside of me. I just need wisdom, wisdom from on high. And you know what the Bible says? If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And if that's you and you say, you know, I need God's wisdom, I can use some of that right now. Would you raise a hand? You're just saying, Lord, I'm asking. You said ask, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. As we bow our heads, you might be here and say, you know, Wayne, I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Because I've been to church and I know stuff about church, but you know what I need most of all? His presence in my heart. Not just more knowledge. That's good, but I need His presence. I need forgiveness and a new beginning. I just want to lay everything at His feet that I've done. I want a new start. Man, I need that. And that only comes from the cross where Jesus' blood was shed to give forgiveness so that we can begin again. That's what it means to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not just know about Him as Lord and Savior, but to receive Him. And the Bible says, then you exchange your past for His future. That's a choice that you make. It's a choice of faith. If that's you, would you raise a hand and you're saying, I want to do that. I want to do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, all right. I want to receive him. Yeah, okay. God bless you. Yeah, all right. You too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Great. You can put your hands down. Thanks. Would you reach out and take a hold of the person's hand next to you? 
And let's pray this prayer. Would you pray it after me as we conclude? But let's make this our prayer. And if this is the first time you've received Christ, go to the table outside and ask them for a yes packet. Because you said yes to Christ. In it is a Bible and some follow-up material free of charge. They'll give that to you. It'll help you a lot. But let's pray this prayer. Would you pray this after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you came and died for my sins. That I might have life everlasting. Change my heart. I ask for wisdom. Give me a new beginning. And now I say this so everyone hears, so you hear me, so I hear myself, so the devil hears. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is my Savior. I belong to Him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome these who made that decision to follow Jesus. Wow. Oh